Hey guys, welcome back to the classroom. This is our week three update for distance learning for Ms. Hofheimer's ELA classroom. Um, we're gonna do the same thing we did last time where I go over some updates, this week's assignment, and then I'll read the next three chapters in our refugee book. So as soon as you see the icon for the refugee book come up, if you are not interested in finding out what happens next, then you can go ahead and move on and do the assignment. Um, first of all, I really loved reading your diary entries from last week. It was exciting to see that a lot of you guys are still reading. Um, or finding things to do that aren't just hanging out on your phones. Um, it seems like a lot of y'all are staying positive during this time, which is awesome to see. So I should have commented on all of them. Um, we're going to do something like that every week where I ask you guys to just write a little bit about what you've been up to so that I can get some ideas for stuff that maybe I can do too because I'm also getting bored at home. So I'm excited to see those this week. Um, also this week we are going to change things up a little bit with our assignment. So instead of putting a bunch of attachments in your assignment tab, um, we're going to upload one PowerPoint and you're going to have your own copy and you'll kind of go through the PowerPoint almost like a little video. So in the PowerPoint, your first screen is going to be directions and then the next one is going to have a review video and some extra resources and then you will be doing your work directly into that PowerPoint. So you won't have to create a document, you won't have to try to upload something new, everything's going to be right there for you with the directions next to the slide. So hopefully that'll make things a little bit easier. Um, I'm really enjoying the feedback you guys are giving me. So if you're on the assignment and something is not making sense, chances are other people are having trouble with the instructions too. So please reach out and let me know. I know that the um, vocabulary video didn't play super well last week and a lot of you guys couldn't hear it. Um, so that's something that hopefully got smoothed out for this week as well. So when you go to the assignment, it's just gonna be one assignment for this week. You're gonna click on it. It's gonna take you to your own copy of the PowerPoint and you'll basically just go through and fill it out kind of like an interactive worksheet. If you have questions, you can do one of two things. You can either email me directly, you know my email, or you can make a comment directly onto your presentation um, in the little comment box, which is what most of you have been doing, and I'll be able to respond to it at that time as well. Um, another thing that is slightly changing, I'm still going to make the due date, the official due date, um, Saturday at midnight, so you have all of Sunday off from your work. But I'm asking you guys to do me a favor. If you have any questions about the assignment, please, please, please ask me before Friday evening um, because Saturday I may not be by my computer the whole day. And so if you have a question about last minute assignment stuff, I would really like to get that cleared up first. So I think that's it for the assignment for this week. Um, it is going to be reviewing text structures, which you guys did an amazing job at um, back in, I guess we did it in November. Um, if you guys remember, you guys created a poster with um, comparing and contrasting um, cause and effect, problem solution paragraphs. You're gonna be doing the same thing this week, except instead of picking an animal to do that about, you're gonna be picking a natural disaster from the list available in the PowerPoint. You'll be picking one and then you'll be generating your own paragraphs, either a compare contrast, a problem solution, a sequence, and all of the review for that is gonna be in the PowerPoint presentation as well as a vocabulary. This one does work. I promise you guys will be able to hear it in case you missed the one from last week. So um, all of the steps are in the PowerPoint. You can reach me at any time. Um, you can leave comments and then when I'm by my computer again, I'll respond to them. And then if you guys need um, additional help and you want me to do a phone call check-in, you can just email me um, and I'll call your parents' number and, and reach you through there. So I think that is it. Um, I did say that we might be able to see the dog, but unfortunately he is um, in his kennel because he was being bad. So here is Mars again. He's super proud of all of the hard work that you guys are doing. He's super excited to get to see the work that you guys do this week. Um, and I'm gonna put him down before he bites me. So y'all, here's the novel. Again, please keep reaching out. I really miss you guys. I'm so proud of the fact that almost all of you are still doing the work. Um, and I'm excited to see what we do this week. All right, here's the novel. Joseph, somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean, 1939, 11 days from home. Joseph's mother grabbed for his father's flailing arms, but Aaron Landau was too strong for her, thin as he was. No, no, they're coming for us, he said, his eyes frantic. The ship is slowing down. Can't you feel it? We're slowing so they can turn us around, take us back to Germany. Joseph's father pulled his arm away and knocked over a lamp. It fell to the floor with a crash and the light went out. Joseph, help me, his mother begged. Joseph pulled himself away from the wall and tried to grab one of his father's arms while his mother went for the other. 
In the corner of her bed, Ruthie buried her face in Bitsy's ears and cried. No, Joseph's father cried. We have to hide. Do you hear me? We can't stay here. We have to get off this ship. Joseph grabbed his father's arm and held on tight. No, Papa, we're not turning around, Joseph said. We're slowing for a funeral, a funeral at sea. Joseph's father stopped dead, but Joseph kept a tight hold on him. He hadn't wanted to tell his father about the funeral, but now it seemed the only way to calm him down. Aaron Landau's bulging, haunted eyes swept to his son. A funeral? Who's died? A passenger? It was the Nazis who did it. I knew they were on board. They're after us all. He began to thrash again, more panicked than before. No, Papa, no, Joseph said. He fought to hold on to his father. It was an old man, Professor Weiler. He was sick when he came aboard. It's not the Nazis, Papa. Joseph knew all about it. Ruthie had begged him to go swimming in the pool with her and Renata and Evelyn that afternoon. But Joseph was a man now, not a boy. He was too old for kids' stuff. He'd been walking the outside boardwalk on B-deck instead, keeping an eye out for the man from the engine room, Shindick, and his friends when he'd heard a cry from one of the cabin portholes. Peeking inside, he saw a woman with long, curly black hair and a white dress sobbing as she lay across the body of an old man. Captain Schroeder and the ship's doctor were there, too. The man in the bed was perfectly still, his mouth open, and his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. He was dead. Joseph had never seen a dead body so close up before. You there, boy! Joseph had jumped. A woman walking her little dog on the boardwalk had, uh, on B-deck had caught him peeping. He had sprinted away as the little dog barked at him, but not before Joseph heard the ship's doctor say that Professor Wheeler had died of cancer. In his family's cabin now a few hours later, Joseph still clung to his father's arm, trying to calm him down. He was an old man, and he'd been sick for a long time already, Joseph told his father. They're burying him at sea because we're too far away from Cuba. Joseph and his mother hung on to his father until Joseph's words finally got through. Papa stopped struggling against them and sagged. Suddenly, they were holding him up off the floor. He was sick already, Papa asked. Yes, it was the cancer, Joseph said. Joseph's father let them guide him to his bed where he sat down. Mama went to Ruthie to comfort her. When is the funeral, Papa asked. Late tonight, Joseph told him. I want to go, his father said. Joseph couldn't believe it. Papa hadn't left the cabin in 11 days, and now he wanted to go to the funeral of someone he'd never met? In his condition? Joseph looked worriedly to his mother, who held Ruthie in her lap. I don't think that's such a good idea, Mama said, echoing Joseph's thoughts. I saw too many men die without funerals at Dachau, Papa said. I will go to this one. It was the first time his father had even spoken the name of the place he'd been, and it was like a winter frost covered everything in the room. It ended the conversation as quickly as it had begun. Take Joseph with you then, Mama said. Ruthie and I will stay here. That night, Joseph led his father to a deck aft where the captain and his first officer waited with a few other passengers. The passenger's clothes looked shabby and it was only when he heard his father tearing his shirt that Joseph understood. Ripping your garments was a Jewish tradition at funerals and they had torn theirs in sympathy with Mrs. Wheeler. Joseph pulled on his own collar until the seam ripped. His father nodded, then led him to the sandbox by the pool and had him take a handful of sand. Joseph didn't understand, but he did as he was told. The elevator to a deck arrived, and Mrs. Wheeler emerged first, a candle in hand. Behind her came the rabbi and four sailors who carried Professor Wheeler's body on a stretcher. He was bound up tight in a white sailcloth like an Egyptian pharaoh. Hold on there. The man from below deck, Shindik, pushed through the small crowd with two fellow crew members. I'm Otto Schindek, the Nazi party leader on this ship, he said, and German law says that a body buried at sea must be covered with the national flag. Schindek unfurled the red and white Nazi flag with the black swastika in the middle, and the passengers gasped. Papa pushed his way forward. Never. Do you hear me? Never. It's a sacrilege. He was shaking worse than ever. Joseph had never seen his father this angry, and he was frightened for him. Schindek wasn't the kind of man you wanted to mess with. Joseph grabbed his father's arm and tried to pull him away. Papa spat at the feet of Shindik. This is what I think of you and your flag. Shindik and his men surged forward to avenge the insult, but Captain Schroeder quickly intervened. Stop this. Stop this at once, steward, Captain Schroeder commanded. Shindik addressed his captain but never took his eyes off Joseph's father. It's German law, and I see no reason for an exception to be made in this case. And I do, Captain Schroeder said. Now take that flag and leave here, Mr. Shindig, or I will relieve you off duty and have you confined to your quarters. The steward held Papa's gaze a long moment more. His eyes shifted to Joseph, giving him goosebumps, and then Shindig turned and stormed away. Joseph's chest heaved like he'd been running a marathon. He was so wound up, he was quivering worse than his father. Sand slipped from his shaking fist. The captain apologized profusely for the disturbance, and the funeral continued. 
The rabbi said a short prayer in Hebrew, and the sailors slid the body of Professor Wheeler over the side of the ship. After a moment, there was a, a quiet splash, and the mourners said together, Remember, God, that we are of dust. One by one, they stepped to the rail where they released handfuls of sand, the sand Joseph's father had told him to take from the sandbox. Joseph joined his father at the rail, and they scattered their sand in the sea. Captain Schroeder and his first officer put their caps back on and saluted. They touched the brims of their hats, Joseph noticed, instead of giving the Hitler salute. Without words, the funeral service broke up. Joseph expected his father to return to their cabin right away, but instead he lingered at the rail, staring down into the dark waters of the Atlantic. What is he thinking, Joseph wondered. What happened to him at Dachau that he's now a ghost of the man he was? At least he didn't have to be buried in the hell of the Third Reich, his father said. The ship rumbled softly, and Joseph knew the captain had restarted their engines. They were on their way to Cuba again. But how much time had they lost? Isabel, The Straits of Florida, somewhere north of Cuba, 1994, one day from home. The tanker emerged from the darkness like some giant leviathan come to swallow them. It stood at least seven stories tall out of the water and was so wide it filled the horizon. Its pointed bow sent huge waves sluicing away and two massive anchors stood out from the sides like the horns on a monster. Isabel quailed in fear. It was straight out of a nightmare. A ship, Lido yelled. We've drifted into the shipping lanes. But by now everyone had seen it. The rumble of the ship's massive engines had awakened Mami and Senora Castillo, and everyone was scrambling around in the boat in a panic, making it rock dangerously. It's coming right for us, Amara screamed. Isabel climbed over Yvonne, trying to get as far away from the tanker as she could. She slipped and fell with a splash into the bottom of the boat. Everybody settle down, Senor Castillo cried, but no one was listening. We have to get the engine started, Poppy cried. He yanked frantically on the starter chain, barely giving the engine time to cough and die before he yanked on it again. Don't! You'll flood it and it'll never start, Luis said, trying to wrestle the chain from him. Where are the matches? Lido cried. We have to start a fire. They can't see us in the dark. Here, said Ivan. He lifted a matchbox from the styrofoam carton that held the few emergency supplies they'd brought. No, Poppy yelled. He lunged for Ivan's outstretched hand and together they fell against the side of the boat, tipping it. Isabel's mother fell into the pool of water on the bottom and slid into the side of the boat with a thump. Isabel crawled to help her. Lido grabbed Poppy by the shirt. What are you doing, he demanded. Poppy held the matchbox out of Lido's reach. We don't want to be seen, you old fool, he yelled over the growing thunder of the tanker. If they see us, they'll have to rescue us. It's maritime law, and if they rescue us, they'll send us back to Cuba. Would you rather they send us to the ocean floor, Lido yelled. Isabel couldn't help looking up as she pulled her mother out of the water. It's getting closer, Isabel cried. The tanker was still hundreds of meters away, but it was so huge it felt like it was on top of them. They were never getting out of its way. Isabel's heart thumped so hard she thought it was going to burst right out of her chest. If we don't want them to know we're here, maybe we shouldn't start the engine, Amara yelled. They'll never hear us no matter what we do, Senor Castillo said. The tanker was so loud now it sounded like a jet engine. He and Luis flipped a switch on their own engine and yanked the starter chain again. A puff of gray smoke poofed out from the engine, but it didn't catch. The tanker loomed larger, closer. Isabel cringed. It was going to hit them. Luis yanked on the chain. A cough. A sputter, nothing. Cough, sputter, nothing. Cough, sputter, nothing. The sea swelled in front of the tanker, pushing them higher and away, and for a fleeting moment, Isabel's hopes rose with it. But then the swell passed, and they were pulled back in by the tanker's massive draw. Their little blue boat <clears throat> spun sideways, and they zoomed toward the big ship's prow. The tanker was going to tear them in half right down the middle. Isabel looked up into the terrified eyes of Yvonne as he realized the same thing, and they screamed. Then, suddenly, they were both thrown to the bottom of the boat, and something buzzed like a mosquito underneath the howl of the tanker. Luis had gotten the engine to start. Their little boat shot forward in the water, darting out of the way of the tanker's prow. But the waves thrown off by the big ship lifted up the back end of Isabel's boat and dumped an ocean of seawater on top of them. Isabel swallowed a mouthful of salty water and tumbled across the boat. She slammed into something hard, and her shoulder exploded with pain. She came up spluttering. She was hip deep in water and the engine had stopped again, but none of that mattered right now. Yvonne's father had fallen overboard. Isabel saw his white-haired head rise out of the water. Senor Castillo gulped for air, then disappeared as a wave from the massive tanker's wake rolled over him. Senor Castillo, Isabel cried. Papa, Yvonne shouted, where is he? Do you see him? Isabel and Yvonne frantically searched the dark water, watching for Senor Castillo to surface again. They had missed the huge ship's prow by mere meters, but the wave... The waves the behemoth created as it passed were just as dangerous. 
The ocean heaved and sank, the little boat tipping over sideways as the waves caught it amidships. Everyone was just getting back from the floor of the boat when they were sent tumbling again. Yvonne rolled to the other side of the boat, but Isabel hung on. There! She saw Castillo, Senor Castillo's head pop up from under the water, but only for a gasping second, too quick to get enough air. In a flash, Isabel remembered her grandmother disappearing under the waves just like that two years ago, and without another thought, Isabel dove in after Senor Castillo. Mahmoud, Izmir, Turkey, 2015, 11 days from home. Mahmoud screamed. He howled louder than a fighter jet, and his parents didn't even tell him to hush. Lights came on in houses nearby, and curtains ruffled as people looked out at the noise. Mahmoud's mother broke down in tears, and his father let the life jackets he carried drop to the ground. The smuggler had just told them their boat wasn't leaving tonight. Again. No boat today, tomorrow. Tomorrow, he told Mahmoud's father. It was exactly the same thing he told Mahmoud's father the day before, and the day before that, and every day for the last week. A text would come telling them to hurry, hurry, out to the beach, and every time they would pack up what few things they owned, grab the life jackets, and rush through the streets of Izmir to this parking lot, and every time there would be no boat waiting for them. First it was the weather, the smuggler said. Then another family that was supposed to go with them hadn't arrived yet. Then it was the Turkish Coast Guard patrols, or the boat wasn't ready. There was always some reason they couldn't leave. It was like some cruel schoolyard game of keep away. Mahmoud and his family were at their wit's end. This off and on again business was tearing them apart. All except for Walid, lifeless Walid, who didn't flinch when bombs exploded. I want to go back to Syria. I don't care if we die, Mahmoud said after he'd let out his scream. I just want to get out of here. Even as he said it, he heard the whine in his voice, the pathetic, toddler-like frustration. Part of him was embarrassed. He was older than that, more mature. He was almost a man. But another part of him just wanted to stomp his feet and pitch a fit, and that part of him was getting harder and harder to keep quiet. Little Hanna started crying too, and Mahmoud's mother tried to calm them both by pulling Mahmoud into a hug. Look at it this way, Dad said. Now we have more time to practice our Turkish. But no one laughed. Let's get back to the mall before someone takes our place, Mom said wearily. Mahmoud carried the life jacket so his father could carry Walid, who quickly fell asleep on his father's shoulder. His mother carried Hana. Even though Mahmoud hated the desperate feeling of going back in defeat to the mall, at least it meant not sleeping outside in the park. But this time, someone was waiting for them at the mall entrance. There were two of them, both Turkish men, in matching blue tracksuits. One of them was muscular, with curly black hair, a thin beard, and a thick gold chain necklace. The other was overweight and wore mirrored sunglasses, even though it was night. He was the one with the pistol stuck in the waist of his pants. You want inside? You gotta pay rent, the burly man told them. Since when, Mahmoud's father said. Since now, the man said. We own this building and we're tired of you Syrians freeloading. More bullies, thought Mahmoud, just like in Syria. Mahmoud's legs went numb and he thought he might fall over. He couldn't bear the thought of walking any farther, looking for a place to live again. How much, Mahmoud's father asked wearily. 5,000 pounds a night, the muscular man said. Dad sighed and started to put Waleed down so he could pay the man. Each, the man said. Each? Per night, Dad said? Mahmoud knew his dad was doing the math in his head. There were five of them, and they'd already been here a week. How long could they afford to pay 25,000 pounds a day and still have enough for the boat and whatever came afterward? No, Mahmoud's father said. Mom started to protest, but he shook his head. No, we already have all our things. We'll find someplace else to stay. It's only until tomorrow. The big man chuckled. <laughs> right, tomorrow. Mahmoud staggered along behind his parents as they roamed the streets of Izmir looking for some place to sleep. His parents carried Walid and Hana, but not him. He was too old to be carried anymore, and for the first time, he wished he wasn't. They finally found the doorway of a travel agency set back from the street, and no one else was sleeping there. They were just settling in when a Turkish police car came down the street. Mahmoud shrank back into the corner, trying to be invisible, but the police car's lights came on and it beeped its electric siren at them. Blurp, blurp! You can't sleep there, a police officer told them through a loudspeaker, and so they had to get up and walk again. Mahmoud was so tired he started to cry, but he did it softly so his parents wouldn't hear. He hadn't cried like this since that first night when the bombs had started to fall on Aleppo. Another car came down the road, and at first Mahmoud worried it was another police car, but it was the BMW sedan. On a whim, Mahmoud darted out into the car's headlights and waved the life jackets on his arms. Mahmoud, no, his mother cried. The BMW slowed, its lights brightened his face. The driver honked at him, and Mahmoud hurried around to the driver's side window. Please, can you help us? Mahmoud begged. My baby sister. But the car was already shooting away. Another car followed it, and it drove right past Mahmoud. 
Mahmoud, get out of the street, his father called. You'll get yourself killed. Mahmoud didn't care anymore. There had to be someone who would help them. He waved the life jack jackets at the next car, and miraculously it stopped. It was an old brown Skoda, and the driver rolled the window down by hand. He was an elderly, wrinkled man with a short white beard, and he wore a black and white kiffia headscarf. Please, can you help us, Mahmoud asked. My family and I have nowhere to go, and my baby sister is only and my sister is only a baby. Dad jogged up and tried to pull Mahmoud away. We're very sorry, Mahmoud's father told the man. We didn't mean to bother you. We'll be on our way. Mahmoud was annoyed. He'd finally gotten somebody to stop, and now his father was trying to send him away. My house is too small for all of you, the man said, but I have a little car dealership, and you can stay in the office. Arabic. Mahmoud was thrilled. The man spoke fluent Arabic. No, no, we couldn't possibly, Mahmoud's father started to say, but Mahmoud cut him off. Yes, thank you, Mahmoud cried. He waved his mother over. He speaks Arabic, and he says he will help us. Dad tried to apologize again and refused the offer of help, but Mahmoud was already climbing in the back seat with the load of life jackets. Mom got in beside him with Hana, and Mahmoud's father shifted Walid in his arms so she, he could reluctantly sit in the front passenger seat. Mahmoud, his father said, unhappy, but Mahmoud didn't care. They were off their feet, and they were on their way to someplace they could sleep. The little Skoda's gears ground as the man got them underway. My name is Samin Nasir, the man told them, and Mahmoud's father introduced them all. You're Syrian, yes? Refugees? The man asked. I know what it's like. I am a refugee too, from Palestine. Mahmoud frowned. This man was a refugee, and he owned his own car and his own business? How long have you lived in Turkey, Mahmoud asked Mr. Nasir. Sixty-seven years now, Mr. Nasir said, smiling at Mahmoud in the rearview mirror. I was forced to leave my home in 1948 during the First Arab-Israeli War. They are still fighting there, but someday, when my homeland is restored, I will go home again. Dad's phone chimed, surprising them all and making Walid stir. His father read the glowing screen. It's the smuggler. He says the boat is ready now. Mahmoud had learned not to get excited about these texts, but even still, he still, but even so, he still felt a little flutter of hope in his chest. You take a boat to Greece tonight, Mr. Nasir asked. Maybe, Mahmoud's father said, if it's there. I will take you to it, Mr. Nasir said, and if it is not there, you can come back and stay with me. You're very kind, Mom said. Mahmoud didn't know why, but his mother pulled Mahmoud close and gave him a hug. It took very little time for the car to take them back to the beach, and when they pulled to a stop, they were all quiet as they stared. This time, finally, a boat was there.